Hello, friends and neighbors. We are back. It's the Bitter Southerner podcast from Georgia Public Broadcasting and the magazine I edit, The Bitter Southerner. I'm Chuck Reese. I'm your host, and I'm happy to welcome you to season two of our podcast. This is episode one. We're so happy to be back with all y'all for a second season, and I am excited about this one. We've got 10 episodes lined up for you, scheduled for release every two weeks until we finish up in March, and we hope you're thirsty for them. We heard a lot of nice things from y'all about season one, and a lot of good suggestions I hope you'll hear being addressed as we play out season two. And one person in particular wrote a review of season one on Apple Podcasts that said, and I quote, there's a lyrical quality to it, a poetry in the sound of the native tongue that mesmerizes me. I feel like I'm on somebody's porch, listening to them tell me about what really matters in life. Now, I was surprised by that. I really was because, and, and, and not just because someone, you know, seemed to actually like the way I, in particular, talk. I was surprised because all of us who speak in a southern twang or drawl, of which there are many varieties, often encounter a completely different reaction, which normally goes like, man, you must be stupid. And it occurred to me that maybe it's time for us to make an episode about the accent itself. Let me bring in our producer, Sean Powers. He's sitting here. Sean, do you think we need to make an episode like that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Chuck, at the end of last season's podcast, we heard from Laura Rellier. She's a writer out of Athens, Georgia, and she told us a little bit about what it was like losing her southern accent at a young age. Uh, And this was when she was 10 years old. Her family moved from Charlotte, North Carolina to Chicago, Illinois. And even all these years later, as an adult, she still thinks about it. It's painful. And it was just very clear that southerners but even people who aren't from the South have a very complicated relationship with the way the Southern accent sounds. And we were just scratching the surface with that last season. And this season on the podcast, you and I both agreed it was time to go even deeper. Yeah, and I think it's time also to make a point that you shouldn't feel bad about how you talk. Absolutely. What you should do is learn how to embrace it. Now, I was born and raised with this voice. There's not anything I can do about it. And I did try for a while. That was when I lived in New York City. Two separate times, seven years in total. And try as I might, I couldn't shake the way I talked. And it didn't take me long to just give up trying. I just relied on the fact that I was fairly smart You know, I could actually build a compound complex sentence on the fly, and if people couldn't hang with the way I spoke after they figured out that I could do things like that, they could just walk themselves over to the Hudson River and jump right in. Now, you might have just figured it out when we were talking to Sean, but Sean is from the Midwest, and he writes the first draft of every episode. And I then have to go through it and make it sound like something I would say. Now, don't get me wrong. By the time Sean is done with me, he's going to know more about the South than he ever dreamed. We're schooling him. But the thing is, and this took me a while, but I have become proud of my speech patterns. Like, if you assume that I'm dumb because of how I speak, I just think the joke's on you. Still, I don't know any Southerner anywhere whose accent hasn't given them some trouble at at least one point in their life. Let's listen to a contributor to the Bitter Southerner, Dartinia Hall, talk about that. When I'm writing personally, my voice is very Southern, and I wouldn't change that for anything. But I really do wish that I still had that accent. I miss it. Dartinia lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, and she was raised in Rock Hill, South Carolina. She says that growing up, her southern accent was a point of contention even in her own home. 
because she remembers her mom pressing her to lose it. So mom spent a lot of time taping my voice. This was back when we used tape recorders. And she would let me listen. And I remember listening to that and thinking, I don't sound like that. That's not me. But it was. And she said, you can't, you can't do this. And she was doing this out of love. It was definitely a place of love for me. Dartinia was a black girl living in the South. And her mom figured that her skin color alone would set her back. And that her accent would just make the burden heavier. I think she thought that people would think that I was um, somehow less than. And she did not want that. She did not want it. She said, you're, you're already going to deal with issues when you go out into the world. You're, you're a woman of color. Well, she, she, you're a black woman. And you're going to be a black woman. And you are going to already have struggles. I don't want people thinking that you're not smart. As Dartinia's family moved around South Carolina, over time she began losing her draw, but she says it's not completely gone. I notice that when I'm around friends that I grew up with, when I'm around my cousins, when I'm really relaxed with my family, it comes back. And I think what comes back with that is everything that my grandmother was and everything that my great-grandmother was. I want to make homemade lemonade. I want to bake a pie. I want to make people feel welcome. There's something, a part of me comes along with that accent. And even though I know it's not what it used to be, there's something that's still there that is very deeply and indelibly me. On today's show, we open our ears and hearts to what some Southerners think of as an obstacle and what others, like me, consider a great gift. So welcome to an episode that we have entitled, with the greatest respect for the late writer Raymond Carver, what we talk about when we talk about how we talk. We're about to talk with three comedians about their Southern accents. So you know how comedians are. They can get a bit crude with their language. So just a warning, this next conversation may not be appropriate for some of the younger ears who are listening with you. Now, when we were planning this show, I kept thinking back to this one sketch I'd seen on Comedy Central's website. And the setting is three Southern guys walk into a bar where they meet a New Yorker and scene. Look, we get it, all right? The accents, the Fox News level of anger that we emit, the cheap beer. Pops, give me gas. But you think it's because we think that fancy beer makes you gay. You gotta drink liquor if you want a liquor. It's gross. Come on. The point is, just like how not everyone with your accent wants to beat his wife with a pepperoni stick. You know, shout out to your cousin Tony and all. A great guy, gets out in a year. Not everyone with our accent is ignorant. Yeah, or wants to get rid of the blacks. Blacks rubbing buttered corn on their belly. What? Can we get the bell? <laughs> that sketch comes from the minds of three men who have become my dear friends over the last few years. They're the liberal rednecks of the comedy circuit. Gentlemen, y'all introduce yourselves. I'm Trey Crowder. I grew up in Salina, Tennessee, and uh, one thing that everybody in Salina liked to say because it was true was that we had more liquor stores than traffic lights. My name is Drew Morgan, and I'm from Sunbright, Tennessee, and the uh, fake myth that everyone knows is fake but still spread to little kids is that uh, a black man was up on Pea Ridge taking a pee, and that's how it got its name. And the sun came up, and he said, Sun Bright. And I have no idea why he was black in the myth. There are no black people there. My name is Corey Ryan Forster. I grew up in Chickamauga, Georgia. Chickamauga, Georgia is famous for the Battle of Chickamauga, which is a battle that the South won. And if you don't believe me, just look at every bumper sticker ever. Now, together, Trey, Drew, and Corey travel America as the well-read comedy tour, and that is R-E-D. Get it? They joined us from a tour stop in Little Rock, Arkansas, for this conversation. 
these boys have been surprising America for three or four years with the words that come out of their mouths, and particularly with the words that come out of their mouths that most people would not expect come out of mouths with such accents. So I wanted to know what they've learned along the way. Trey Crowder and Drew Morgan responded first. Trey actually has a whole bit now that he's moved to Southern California, because you know that's where TV is, about how his accent is perceived out there. I get uh, skepticism quite a bit, which has always been funny to me. Like people don't think that they think I'm putting on or it's a, like a part of an act or gimmick or something that I don't actually talk like this because it's hard for them to believe that somebody who sounds like me could have, you know, found California. Definitely uh, people are like freaked out by it sometimes because it's so uncommon out there, but also the negative connotations that a lot of people have for it. So anyway, that's my take on it. I don't know how Drew's felt about it. I have a different bit about the receiving of my specific accent, which is Appalachian. That's how you say that word, God damn it. And uh, it's about how people are afraid of that and they're sort of upset or they're pining for what they call the pretty or nice Southern accent. And I think it's very interesting that people are more afraid of mine and Trey's accent than they are Strom Thurmond's. And they think mine is racism and oppression, and mm-hmm. it's ironic how flip-flopped the truth right. is there. Right. And I think that that's... Like, they could trust you if you talked like a slave owner. Right, but, exactly. <laughs> but you... But talking like a factory worker, yeah. that ain't well, it. Well, in the bit, I don't want to do... But, it, you know, I, it, I really think it has a lot to do with the fucking movie Deliverance. I think for a generation of people, this accent is now banjos and butt sex. Like, mm-hmm. that's what it is, you know? And both of those are painful. Now, I think we need to hear from that Chickamauga boy, too, Corey Forrester. To echo what those guys said, like, it's it's pretty crazy, like, people that I meet in this industry who have known us for a while uh, and know the whole whole deal. Like, they're like, you're the liberal rednecks. We, you know, we understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to show us that, like, everybody with that accent isn't an idiot. But it still seems like they're confu- they're still confused about it. Like, any time I say anything decently smart, they're like, I just can't believe that just came out of you. And, uh, you know, it's insulting, but it's also kind of a cheat code. Yeah. You know, in a way, like, it's, it feels like... I can get away with a lot because when I do something stupid, it's just, you know, as they said about Manny Ramirez, Manny being Manny. But then when I do something smart, it seems extra smart. Well, I mean, my my experience the first time I moved up to New York City back in the in 1984 uh, sounds pretty damn similar to what you guys are talking about. But uh, like the way I handled it up there, like when someone would marvel at the fact that I used the word y'all. I would try to do something smart, like make the point, you know, because I was around a lot of writers and editors and stuff, and I would make the point that y'all is a needed word because the English pers- the English language has a second person singular pronoun, you. It has a second person plural pronoun that is also you. And or and and uh, the second person plural should be y'all, and like y'all is legitimately needed in the English language. And I said, bonus. Not only is it a second person plural pronoun that's missing from the language, it also has a plural emphatic, all y'all, as in fuck all y'all. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I. I've, I personally feel like uh, people have started to come around on the on on y'all as a word. Like I oh, feel yeah. like I've seen people, not Southerners, on the internet and wherever else, just out in the world, uh, sort of lauding the word y'all the way you because it's also you know gender inclusive, right? Yeah. Which is a big plus nowadays. Oh, yeah. they they gonna take it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. It will it will be y'alls yeah. eventually. They'll, it'll be their word. Well, we said yuns in Salina. We we said y'all also. We yeah. said yuns. We said yuns in Salina as well. Well, I grew up in L. J. Georgia saying yuns too. Yeah. Uh, some of my cousins said yuns, yuns and I always yeah. thought they were like. Were they from Pittsburgh? Well, I, yeah, I thought they were maybe doing it. I don't know, you know, trying to be cool or something. Well, let me let me ask y'all this now. 
how do your southern audiences react to all this enlightened liberalism that y'all guys have uh, coming out of mouths like y'all's? Well, and I mean, you know, you, you've been to some of our shows before, and so the thing is, the people that, and I, I've said this a lot, but I mean, it's true, I believe this, the people that, like, there are plenty of people in the South who sound like us who, if they are aware of us at all, they are not fans. The people that actually do come to the show, like buy a ticket and show up, are nearly across the board already on well on board with us to begin with so like it's not surprising or shocking to them if it was just a general southern audience like like if y'all were opening for foxworthy or something right sure yeah yeah. it would be uh and we've all had that experience too because we all came up in the south and nobody knew who we were we were for most of that time and we go up in front of general southern audiences and i mean yeah you can shock and upset some people for sure but shock value really isn't what these guys are going for they have a message for other folks who talk like them, folks who would listen to them because they talk the way they do, but who might disagree strongly with what they're actually saying. Here's part of a Corey Forrester bit. From the point of view of an old Southern man pondering whether gay people should be allowed to serve in the military. They also shouldn't be able to serve in the military for uh, reasons <laughs> Of which I have none at the moment, but I will go home and watch Sean Hannity and report back as soon as I can on what it is. Corey says jokes like that, though, have to change over time because their message has to change with the times. You, Chuck, have heard me do the bit. It's on our uh, it's on our critically acclaimed album, Well Read Live from Lexington. It's my closing bit that I did about um, it was gays in the military, which I ended up changing to transgender in the military because when I wrote the joke, uh, don't ask, don't tell was still very much a policy. And so it's one of the first real good jokes that I wrote, and I was doing it 10 years ago in the South, and I would always close with it. And it always got laughs, mainly because I'm a very good comedian and it was very well written, but... Uh, It was always, I could tell that a lot of the audience was laughing at like, listen to him saying all this stuff. It took them by surprise. And I think that some of them maybe thought that I truly didn't believe it. I was just saying it Uh, as a shock thing. Another thing that I always thought back in those days was that, not think, I mean, I feel like I know this. It did upset some people. Some people get offended at some of my material or whatever. But I also always felt like they would, even if they weren't on board with it, the people in the audience who weren't, they would let me get away with it yeah. for a little bit because of the way I sounded because yeah. they were like well he's one of us so I had like a longer leash like if a New York comic had been there saying the exact same jokes I was saying they no. would have hated yeah me. I mean I've seen that happen but they gave me a little bit of grace because I they were like well he's one of us you know for a little bit sure well, believe me I could still lose them <laughs> but, most, uh, most of my jokes coming up that were like that were religious uh, my dad's a preacher I grew up in the church it caused me a lot of uh, anguish and, and existential issues and I, you know, boy, did it. <laughs> and uh, I feel like honestly, it was everybody, and it, and that still can do it to people. Like even our audiences in the South, it's just it's inside us. If you were raised in the church and you hear someone speaking anything negative about that, even if you agree with it, I think some part of a lot of people like their assholes tighten up and they look around to see if their preachers in the room. You know, kind of like you ain't supposed to say this. Yeah, yeah. There's no. I mean, there's just that's. I guess part of why I'm interested in those jokes, but there's no way around that. I think we're re- well received in the South now, um, Chuck, not just because of what Trey was saying of like we've been sought out, but when I mean, if you go to our shows in the South, it's all the people that we have known exist, but the world, including good-hearted liberal people in Connecticut or whatever, don't think about existing. Liberal people, you know, minorities, queer Southerners, like – all those folks are at our show, and I think it's it's not just like, oh, they're cool with it. Like, that's part of why they're there. And the message is this. Trey Crowder, Drew Morgan, and Corey Forrester believe, as does the bitter Southerner, that what makes Southern culture special is how it arises from all of us, whether our ancestors were from Europe or Africa or the Caribbean or any place else. Here's Corey again. And I'm going to use this as an example, and first off, let me preface it by saying I do not feel that we uh, 
undergo the same prejudice. But like, you know how sometimes you hear people go, "Oh yeah, you know my black my black friend Daryl," but like, you know he don't he don't act black, mm-hmm. you know, like, and they do that whole thing, which is an insanely terrible thing to say. But people say similar things to us, like, "Oh well, you guys, no, I like y'all because right. y'all don't act like you're from the south." And I'm right. like, "Yes, I do. Yeah, I abs- I'm as southern <laughs> as any other human being you well, met. I just think that people or have rights." At D- Drew's been saying since we started this tour, and I completely just like. The idea of why don't we also count? Right. Like when they think about the South, they only think about like the negative stereotypes. Even if they know who we are, they take us and like remove us from the South, you know, because what you were just saying, we're like yeah. exceptions. Well, it's like, no, we should also count and, and not just us, but like Outcast and Roy Wood well, that Jr. One, that, those two, that yeah. makes me angry, honestly, because... I don't know how to feel. I don't know how to express it without sounding like I'm trying to take, you know, ownership culturally of black people, and I'm not, and that would be a horrible thing. But like, why, why don't we talk about Outcast as a Southern artist? Right. Well, because they're black. That's the box that the world wants to put them in. Right. You know what I mean? It's like it's like you could be like. You know, right. Roy's from like a town in Alabama, but he's an urban right. <laughs> comic. Yeah, right. You know yeah, I mean? Roy Wood Jr. being which, an urban comic is ridiculous. Right. It's insane. It, which it's because you can't say black. Right. You know. Right. Right. And 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 you know that's something I've noticed too is like the idea that like black Southerners and white Southerners all consider themselves Southerners for the most part. You know. Uh, and and that we there's this assumption that goes with the accent that we can't have common concerns. Yeah, I mean I, I'm I guilty also, of that, frankly. I have what do you what do you mean? Like uh, when I hear of, of certain Yankee accents, like there are times where I just make certain assumptions about me and that person on specific issues aren't going to find common ground, and, and honestly, on the ones we're talking about right now. Like, I'm already out the gate. Like, yeah, you probably think my dad's an idiot because he hunts and, you know, has a rifle. And since he has a rifle, you think, you know, and, and all those things. And that well, ain't right either. Well, th- that's how I feel when somebody from Connecticut's like, you don't act Southern. And I'm like, well, you're being a judgmental prick. Pretty much what I figured a Connecticut person would be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, of, you know, how y'all have played with that accent in your comedy. And I know I've told y'all this individually, but the, the, the skits you guys did for Comedy Central uh, are just brilliant, man. And like the one about the restaurant. You're from Boone, North Carolina, and you made this menu? Yes. What year did Doc Watson die? What? What percentage Cherokee are you? One sixteenth on my mama's side, one eighth on my daddy's side. Vinegar or ketchup based barbecue? Both. When greeting a fellow southerner, Here, excuse me, right down. how much sugar goes in sweet tea? Till it's sweet enough. Dolly Parton or Dolly. You know, unless the preacher's coming over, then we gotta pretend like it's Jesus for a minute, but I, when you were punished as a kid, where would your parents hit you? Home, school, church, anywhere with sticks, really. That's a phenomenal answer. Mm-hmm. I bet I've watched that thing two dozen times, and I still laugh like hell every time I hear it. We wondered why it had so many views. Yeah, man, we <laughs> appreciate that. It's all me, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like, when you, you know, what's different about writing sketch comedy that builds on that? Or does that come easy to y'all? We're learning as we go. That yeah. that particular one was based on a bit that I did, but I and it worked. I have found with other bits that that doesn't always work and it doesn't always translate as well that particular bit had a was a story it started out as a story me and andy were in a restaurant and i got mad about them having vegan grits that was the bit i mean one thing i specifically did on that sketch and i'll try to do as long as comedy central will let me you know our goal is to get these out to more people grow our audience et cetera, et cetera. but i put what i call little little uh, redneck bat signals out there i mean the references to dale earnhardt and dolly parton are to be funny but also because i'm hoping people see that and go and and when you look in the comments of that one it worked i mean people are being like oh my god I, i'm from the south and they nailed it and then like that is what i was doc, going yeah, for. doc watson specifically because there's you know a lot of people that's a, deep cut. that's a deep cut yeah a lot of people not from the south still get earnhardt and dolly mm-hmm. but the people who were when we threw doc watson was in there people were like okay these dudes are legit <laughs> i can see any liberal elite writer going i'll put dolly part but you put doc watson and talking about when skinner's playing gets gets you know uh what crashed 
gets crashed. Well, Trey, Trey added that. a joke to that when it was um, what was it about snakes you said uh, breeding illegal reptiles. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm really uh, showing myself here how much I care about the comment section. But I, I one of the ones I saw was I saw like two or three people being like, I legit had an uncle who got who had snake illegal snakes. I legit <laughs> nobody got arrested or anything, but like everyone right. had that weird dude in their neighborhood who was like, yeah, you can't get these at the store now. Yeah, everybody got I, a snake guy. Yeah, you gotta have a snake guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you want people all over the country? Because we got people who listen to this in every state of the union. We got people who listen to it in Europe and uh, in Asia. What should those folks know when they hear a southern accent? Man, I don't know. I, so I, what, go ahead. We talk right. about the duality of the southern thing a, a lot. Shout out Patterson Hood, who I think is the first person who coined that, or at least it, as it was far the first as, time I heard yeah, that phrase. It, it, which you know, the bitter southerner is 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 a is you know goes deep with that. I'm I'm feeling some duality right now because I have uh, paradoxical uh, responses. I want someone to hear a southern accent and know that. Um, that we are as diverse, we're not a monolith, we are as diverse as any culture, that when you talk to that person, you might get something you expect. You might get something completely out of left field. If you talk to them for very long, you'll find out that, you know, it's not going to be everything that you expect. And then at the same time, I want that person to know that I don't give a shit what they think. Fuck right. them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think negative stereotypes and the stuff we want people to think when they hear the accent, all putting... Like, no matter which angle you're coming at it from, I think one thing most people can agree that you can assume when you hear a Southern accent is that, you know, we're a pretty good time. Yeah. You're going to be entertained one way or another, even if it's, you, you know, from the, like, Connecticut high horse perspective of, like, you know, uh, we're zoo animals sure. or whatever. Or just, you know, you want to have a good time. Either way you're probably going to enjoy it, uh, right. you know, <laughs> if you start picking the brain of a Southerner. <laughs> but, I I, 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 but I do wish people would, sure, man, there's Honey Boo Boo. Uh, yeah, we got to own that. But I also wish it would be William Faulkner, an outcast, you know? Right. Like, think about those things. You're totally allowed to laugh at us. You just have to acknowledge that we kick ass at food and literature and comedy and art and football. music and football. Like, well, you can make fun of us all you want. You're absolutely allowed to. But come on. We whip your ass at everything I just mentioned. <laughs> I don't want to sound too sappy here, but just, you know, you're talking to a human being. So don't, you know, like when you when you look at, when you hear, like there's this, there's this video online that my sister shares with me all the time, and it is funny, and it's this, it's this old Southern lady, and the video is like somebody, she's being interviewed on the news, and they're like, uh, she got, they got snowed in or something, and they asked her, or, or like there was a blizzard coming, I think. They're like, what are you going to do when you're snowed in? And the woman's like, well, I think we're just going to make us a bunch of stews and casseroles and eat desserts and just get all fat and sassy. <laughs> and it's a funny video to share, but like I look at it, I look at it as like, that's the sweetest thing I've ever seen. And that's like, like, yeah, we can be simple folks, but that doesn't make us stupid and expect to hear a story because everybody in the South has one. If you hear my accent, you know, th there's, there's just more to it. And I just wish that we wouldn't get treated like, you know, Ned Beatty and Deliverance, full circle. Our loving thanks go out to Trey, Crowder, Drew, Morgan, and Corey Ryan Forrester, not just for this interview, but for what they do all over the country all the time. Their work matters. You can go buy tickets to their shows at wellreadcomedy.com. That's W-E-L-L-R-E-D comedy.com. You can hear more of their stand-up routines in the show notes on our website, this, once again, is the Bitter Southerner Podcast, co-produced with Georgia Public Broadcasting. We'll be back after a really short break. Welcome back to the Bitter Southerner podcast, and we are talking about the Southern accent today. Lots of my fellow Southerners have felt the pressure to get rid of theirs in various work or education situations, 
And we're going to hear now from Christy Whitman Howell, who was from Perkinston, Mississippi, originally. Now she lives in the Midwest, and she admits that in some professional settings, she feels the need to do some code switching to turn off her Southern accent. It's something I started doing when I was in college. I was a history major at University of Southern Miss, and we had a faculty member who was new um, from the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, and she made the comment that if I wrote the way I talked, I would have problems in her class. Um, I already knew I wrote well, um, and I've, I've always written fairly well, um, so I decided I would have to change the way I talked, and so I did. Now, that happened more than a decade ago, but it still hurts, Christy, and I get it. These days, she lives in Overland Park, Kansas, where she works on sustainability issues at a community college. People here um, in in Kansas joke that they can tell when I get comfortable with them or they can tell when I've talked to my mother, because those are sort of the two things. If I'm comfortable with you or if I've talked to mama, my accent's going to come out. Um, If I drink at all, um, it comes out like gangbusters. Christy still does see her accent as a point of pride, and when she gets excited about her passion, environmental justice, her twang comes out. When I talk about climate issues, when I talk about renewable energy, when I talk about social justice and equity, and <laughs> I'm doing it again, um, I, I do try um, to make sure that people who are listening to me can understand that Southerners um, have a leadership role and fit in these conversations and have uh, have every right to participate in these conversations. And we do the work um, every day of our lives, even though we may not be the people who are the most um, seen and acknowledged by the mainstream environmental movement. I think that's something. And Christy is not at all the only one who sees her accent as a powerful tool. I do not try to hide it because it's next to impossible for me to do that. Jessica Whatley lives in Los Angeles, California. She's working on a doctorate of social work at USC. We reached her by Skype. She grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, spent most of her adult life in southern Mississippi, somewhere between Macomb and Hattiesburg. Also, like Christy, Jessica's been told to tone that accent down. They're trying to make fun of me, so they'll say things like, you know, oh, that's that redneck social worker. And I've had to explain several times that I'm not offended by that. You know, I say, you know why people's redneck's got red, right? Because they were outside working hard. So I'm not offended that you call me a hard worker. (laughs) And um, then they just go, oh, well. (laughs) Now, why would they think that? Because they've never been to the South. And their only conception of a Southern accent is what Hollywood has designed. And so I end up having these conversations and they say, you don't sound Southern at all. And then I'm like, you know, people in the South don't really talk like Scarlett O'Hare, right? You know, and they don't. They don't know that. They think that I should walk around and just say, like, I declare, you know. (laughs) That's like nobody talks like that in the South. (laughs) You know, they have this very gone with the wind or, like, old South, you know, Hollywood depiction of, of the way that, you know, we should sound. When she's not dealing with nonsense like that, Jessica spends time looking at her ways to fix the criminal justice system from within. She works with clients who struggle with homelessness, mental illness, addiction. And she's in the courtrooms with them, talking to judges, making the case for why her clients maybe should not be incarcerated, but instead get the treatment that they need to be healthy. And in those courtrooms, her accent comes in handy. They have this idea of like slow, genteel type Southerners and I can get up in the courtroom and I can advocate for my clients. And before anybody knows what's going on, the judge oftentimes and even the district attorneys have, oh, yeah, yo, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, oh, you know what? I think that is a good idea. And for some reason, I don't know if it's just because I out talk them or but some reason my clients end up getting better um, deals and getting in diversion more often than other people. 
What Jessica is doing there, I think, is teaching those judges and district attorneys how to love their neighbors a little more, how to see the human being instead of the case file. And Jessica says certain clients even find her voice to be therapeutic. I have clients who ask if they can record something that I say on their phone so that when they're out away from me or out in public, um, just anywhere, if they feel overly anxious or feel like they're going to have a panic attack, they can play it back because they say that my accent is comforting to them. And they like, also they like the phrases, and a lot of them are just things that I heard my mamma say. Just things I heard my mamma say. Now that's how we learn the stories that define who we are. What I've learned over six years of editing The Bitter Southerner is that how we talk, how we hold in reverence the stories that our elders told us, that crosses every racial and cultural line in the South. Almost six years ago, I got the chance to interview for the first time an activist named Michael Render, and you might know him by his rap name, Killer Mike. Now, I recorded this on my phone long before we had this podcast, so please forgive the poor audio quality, but I do want you to hear something Mike said to me that day in 2013 as we sat in the back room of his first barber shop, the Swag Shop in southwest Atlanta. No, we're all Southerners. We're all talk to these draws and twangs. Yeah. You know, we all go to the racetrack on Sundays. We all go fishing. You know, I, I don't necess- I don't have a Dixie flag in the back of my pickup truck, but it still has mud flaps and big tires. So you're talking about <laughs> me too. Right. So why not just be who I am? As we put this episode together, I kept thinking that we needed someone who could write something that got to the heart of how our accents work. And specifically about how people of all races in our region prize the way we speak. And that made me think about Lolas Eric Eli, who is another Bitter Southerner contributor. Lolas grew up in the Treme neighborhood of New Orleans, the son of a schoolteacher mother and a father who was an attorney that fought famously and fiercely for desegregation in New Orleans and all across the South. I first met Lolas five years ago when he had just left his post as a columnist for the New Orleans Times-Picayune to write for the HBO TV show Treme. He's written for the Bitter Southerner several times, and I've honestly encountered very few writers with more capability when it comes to expressing the duality of the Southern thing, how people of vastly different backgrounds can be bound together by our common experiences as Southerners and how we've built a culture that's a gumbo of all of us and all of our ancestors. So I just told Lolas what this episode was about and simply asked him to write something that he could read on our show in a few minutes. I didn't give him any other specifics because I trusted in his ability, both as a writer and as a citizen of the South, to put things in perspective for y'all. And I think he did that. Give a listen. Miss Murphy lived in mortal fear that I would ax her, even though I wasn't planning on it. I was only in third grade. Just to be on the safe side, every time I raised my hand and said I wanted to ask Miss Murphy something, she insisted that I really wanted to ask her, not ax her. Eventually, I got the hint and said the word her way. Most of the folks in my neighborhood were black. We asked each other questions all the time and did nobody get alarmed. But Miss Murphy was white. Apparently among white folks, the sound of the axing was a big deal. Since my sister and I were the first black students to desegregate our ritzy private elementary school, we had to learn to desegregate our language. Our parents had both gone to college and graduate school. My mother was a school teacher by training and was always quick to correct our grammar or syntax. Our father, who was quick to tell anyone that he was born and reared in nigger town, maintained vestiges of his old neighborhood sound even decades later when he argued civil rights cases in court. Miss Murphy's correction got me thinking about right and wrong ways of talking in a way different from how my mother had me thinking about it. 
I developed a conscious awareness that the sound of what you said could color the perception as much as the substance of what you said. It wasn't so much Miss Murphy herself. She was kind and teacherly, and I'm sure she'd been prepared well in advance for the possible complications of an integrated classroom. The kids on playgrounds enforced conformity in ruthless ways. No axers allowed. The Beverly Hillbillies premiered before I was born, but I remember seeing the show. Maybe it had a lot of messages, but one thing was clear. Country folks from the South did weird things, ate weird things, said weird things, and were not like us. No matter how big the bank account or how massive the mansion, these people were the butt of jokes. If you look at the show, which I haven't done in decades, you can also see how some of the jokes are really on the greedy banker and the other Beverly Hills folks who clamored to curry favor with the newly arrived money. But while you might not want to be a greedy banker, you definitely didn't want to be a hillbilly. And wasn't hillbilly just another way of saying Southern? Wasn't anyone who talked like a Southerner a little slow on the uptake? I used to say I was from New Orleans, not from the South. I was proud of my city in a way that I wasn't proud of my state, my region, or even my country. But maybe that was also a way of saying I wasn't a hillbilly. When you write that someone has a southern drawl, everyone can picture it in their ears. But what does a northern drawl sound like, or a west coast one? Isn't there a government program to help the drawless overcome their particular form of poverty? People not from New Orleans sometimes say I have a New Orleans accent. Having heard real New Orleans accents all my life, I know that there are at least a couple, and I know that they're wrong about me having one of them. Still, I think I know what they're reacting to. I know now that I speak English well enough and know the mores of my country well enough that I don't feel the need to police my diction as I once did. I haven't done it lately, but... I imagine myself still capable of axing someone, should I ever again be so inclined. Thank you, Lolas. You, my friend, are a gift to us all. These days, you can find Lolas Eli in Hollywood, where he's a writer and filmmaker and husband and father of two youngins. His credits include Amazon's The Man in the High Castle, the Oprah Winfrey Network series, Greenleaf, and of course, a show I miss very much, HBO's Treme. You can read more of Lolas' stories about his hometown of New Orleans in the show notes section of our website. And that's it for the first episode of Season 2 of the Bitter Southerner Podcast. Our producer is Sean Powers. Josephine Bennett masterfully edits the show. And our thanks go out to all these people, Trey, Drew, Corey, Lolas, Killer Mike, and especially to Dartinia Hull, Christy Whitman Howell, and Jessica Watley. All three of these women are family to us, meaning that they are part of a special group of people who support with their own resources, the Bitter Southerners' efforts to tell stories. We call everybody in that group the Bitter Southerner family. They all think of themselves as family, and you can visit our website to become part of that family yourself. Ever South, our theme song, was written by Patterson Hood and performed by his band, Drive-By Truckers. We heard additional music today from DeWolf Music. Now, if you like the Bitter Southerner podcast, I do wish you would review it and rate it on Apple Podcasts, even if you listen to it somewhere else. Those reviews make sure that more people all around the world get to hear our twangs and our drawls and the fact that, yeah, we're proud of them. The Bitter Southerner podcast is a co-production of Georgia Public Broadcasting and the Bitter Southerner magazine. You can access more from each episode at gpb.org slash podcast. I'm Chuck Reese, and my three instructions remain constant. Hug more necks. Abide no hatred. And always do what you love with the people you love. And, you know, you can remember, too, that it's all right to do that with a twang or a drawl or whatever. (laughs) 